BRC lunch talk. It's a little late for lunch, maybe, but that's what we're still calling it. And uh, we still miss seeing everybody at our in-person events. But um, I think for the time being, this is still a pretty reasonable way to get together and talk about some interesting topics. Um, so I am, uh, if you don't know me, my name is Dr. Sewell. I'm the Director of Education uh, here in the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. And I am here with Dr. Maria Luizos, a researcher in our ADRC, and also Dr. Judy Newbrichel, who's the Medical Director um, of our um, ADRC. Um, and um, what we're gonna do um, after the talk today um, is uh, Maria will post um, a couple of poll questions that you can answer right there on your screen if you'd like. And then we'll have um, some time for questions at the end. And the way that we have been dealing with those um, is having people post the questions in the chat and that way I can just kind of go through um, go through them. And if for some reason we don't get to everyone's questions, we promise we will get back to you after the talk. Um, so everyone's questions will ultimately be answered. Um, so um, I'm so pleased to introduce today's uh, speaker who is going to be talking about light and sleep and the implications of those things for cognitive impairment and dementia. And um, uh, this is a good colleague of ours that um, works, um, collaborates with us on numerous studies in the ADRC, Dr. Mariana Figueroa. Uh, she is the director of the Light and Health Research Center here at Mount Sinai. And she is a professor in the Department of Population Health Science and Policy here in the Icon School of Medicine. Uh, she's very well known for her research on the effects of light on human health, sustainability, circadian photobiology, and lighting for older adults. She's also a fellow of the wonderfully titled Illuminating Engineering Society, and is the author of more than 140 scientific um, articles, and also has given a TED Talk, if I understand. And so I'm delighted to welcome her and um, to hear what you've got to say. Welcome. Thank you. And uh, thank you, everyone, for participating. Um, hopefully, um, as we, we joke, you're going to get out of the talk enlightened. So, But at a minimum, I want you guys to get out of the talk and go for a walk and make sure that you get that light and you'll understand why we're so uh, keen on getting people uh, to get more light during the day so that they can sleep uh, better at night. So um, just a little bit about who we are. Um, we were part of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute for almost 30 years. And in 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, we moved uh, to Mount Sinai. Um, and it, it really has been uh, an amazing um, transition for us. It has opened up a lot of opportunities uh, to work in this area of light and health. And we're actually very fortunate to be collaborating with the ADRC as well. Um, that has always helped us with uh, some of the, our studies, which I will cover <clears throat> at the end of the talk. Now, in addition to working on the impacts of light on human health, we also have areas of research related to plant health. So we use light and UV radiation to, uh, for example, reduce um, pathogens in plants like strawberries or grapes. Um, so we actually work with wineries in the West Coast to find ways to reduce powdery mildew and grapes, for example. Uh, we also do things with transportation safety. So it's um, how we can design our headlights in our cars as well as our street lights to make both the driver and the pedestrian more safe, more safer or safer. Uh, we also obviously do energy efficiency, sustainability, and um, we sometimes get involved in design projects. So we do a lot of things, but today I'm going to focus on the health effects of light and more specifically on how light affects our circadian rhythms. So circadian rhythms are every rhythm in our body that repeats at approximately every 24 hours. Circus is about, D is a day. 
Um, so think about the sleep-wake cycle, think about hormone production. All of that has peaks and troughs over the course of the 24 hours. And what's interesting about these circadian rhythms is that they are generated and regulated by a master biological clock in the brain. So we do have a clock that will, independent of the environment, will continue to generate and regulate those circadian rhythms. Now, the difference is if you are in a dark cave and you have no access to the external environment, these circadian rhythms are gonna run with a period slightly longer than 24 hours. On average, it's about 24.2 hours. So what happens is your biological clock is gonna be delayed or offset by your watch by about 10, 15 minutes a day. So think of it, you in this dark cave for 20, 30 days, eventually day is gonna become night and night's gonna become day, but because you don't know what day and night is because you're in the dark cave, it doesn't matter. But it, it, as I tell a lot of my students, if you have a class at 7.30 in the morning, you want your biological clock to be synchronized with your watch so that you, you can maintain that synchrony and you can do the right thing at the right time. So light, what it does, it synchronizes the biological clock to the local position on earth. So when you wake up in the morning and you get light, what that light is doing is resetting your biological clock so that it runs with a period of 24 rather than 24.2 hours. So it's almost like light moves the hand of the clock every day so that you're not lagging behind your, your watch. It, it synchronizes you uh, with your watch. However, if you don't get enough light during the day, or if you get too much light at night, which may happen, for example, with shift workers, or it may happen if you are very close to your computer screen during the evening hours, light can also be a major disruptor. And disruption of circadian system has been linked to a series of maladies. So it goes from poor performance and poor sleep all the way to increased risk for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, and even cancer. And in fact, this cartoon that you see here is a cartoon from a shift worker, somebody that has been working night shift and rotating shift for many years. You can see that there's a lot of health effects associated with it. And one of the main reasons for that, it's because they are misaligned. They are not, align with the light dark pattern and they're not aligned with the solar day. So we as diurnal species were supposed to be awake during the day and asleep at night. Shift workers do the contrary. They're staying asleep, trying to sleep during the day and staying awake at night. And that's very hard to do. And one of the reasons why it's very hard to do it's because you can't control the sun. The sun will always come up during the day and it will go down at night. So if you can't control the sun, it becomes very hard for you to reverse your circadian pattern so that you're very alert at night and very asleep during uh, the daytime hours. Now, one of the very well-known um, circadian rhythm is the sleep-wake cycle. So theoretically, as a diurnal species, you're supposed to be awake during the day and asleep at night. And your circadian system or your biological clock helps with that. And what it does, it sends you an alerting signal during the day and a sleeping signal at night. Now, in addition to the circadian system, your sleep-wake cycle also receives input from what we call the homeostatic system. And that's sort of like a sleep pressure. When you first get up in the morning, you're well rested if you had a good night's sleep and you have no sleep pressure. As the day goes by and you accumulate number of hours awake, your sleep pressure grows and it keeps going up. So what happens is at night, when you're about to go to bed, you have a lot of sleep pressure and your biological clock switches to tell you to go to sleep instead of to stay awake. And that's when you fall asleep. Now, if there's a desynchrony between the circadian system and your homeostatic system, 
you're going to lay in bed and you're not going to fall asleep or you're going to be falling asleep in the middle of the afternoon when you're not supposed to be falling asleep. So what light does and what light helps with is to maintain that alignment between the circadian and the homeostatic system so that you are awake during the day and you're asleep at night. Now, we do know that in terms of sleep disturbances um, and Alzheimer's disease, this is a very, very uh, strong issue. It's a, there's a lot of um, Alzheimer's disease patients or patients with dementia that do have sleep problems. And that's really one of the main reasons why um, AD patients are institutionalized because it becomes very hard on the caregivers. So finding solutions or finding um, interventions that can help the patient sleep better will help the caregiver and perhaps will maintain the patient at home longer. Now, let me just uh, back up, you know, get start from principles and talk a little bit about why we sleep. Um, there, there was a, a couple of, of quotes that ha I have heard before where people say that if sleep didn't have a very strong reason, it would have been one of the biggest mistakes that nature would have done it. And the reason is when we are sleeping, we are completely vulnerable because we don't know what's happening in the external environment. And if somebody's gonna prey on us or prey on an animal while they're asleep, it's a good time to do that. So um, even though sleeping is necessary, we all need to sleep. There has to be a very good physiological reason why we need to sleep every day. So we're starting to learn a little bit more about that. And there has been some work being done in the past maybe 10 years where the hypothesis is that the sleep cleans up the debris in the brain that we accumulate during wakefulness. So what happens is when we're awake, we're accumulating that debris in the brain. When we go to bed, especially during deep sleep, we have uh, the glymphatic system that throws in the, the um, CSF, which is the cerebrospinal fluid into the brain and it washes up the brain and it cleans up that debris. So the hypothesis is that if you don't have good sleep, if you don't have good deep sleep, you're not cleaning up the brain. If you're not cleaning up the brain, you may be accumulating plaques, which then later on you know, are associated with um, Alzheimer's disease or uh, the A-beta plaques that we know it's one of the hallmark of the disease. Now, the other reason why we know we sleep is that sleep promotes learning and consolidates memory. So even if we're not accumulating plaques and we're not um, diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease um, in a way that we can see the plaques in the brain and so on, we can still affect our memory and our learning consolidation by not sleeping well. So we can still have memory loss or we can still have um, inability to learn new things because we didn't um, sleep well. So this is a very interesting study where they, they taught people a task in the morning and then they repeated the task the same day in the evening and there was no difference. And that's the two green bars that you see there. Then they allow people to sleep and they retested them the following morning and they actually improved their motor skill task. Now, if they did not allow them to sleep, if they let them stay awake all night and retested them in the morning, they show that the, um, the learning went down. So in other words, sleeping helps us consolidate the memory and help people um, test better the following morning. So that notion that we're gonna pull an all nighter to study for an exam, it's a bad idea because what you're doing is you're actually making it worse because you're not allowing yourself to learn and to consolidate that memory uh, or that learning during sleep. Now, sleep deprivation has been linked to many other th things, reduced performance, increased risk for diabetes, obesity, and cardiovascular disease. So not unlike circadian disruption, 
sleep deprivation is also linked to that. Now, these two things are very close in real life. If you are disrupted because you're not receiving um, a strong light dark pattern, you're going to be sleeping badly. If you sleep bad, you're going to have sleep deprivation. So either way that you look at it, circadian disruption and sleep deprivation is affecting health. They are both affecting health. Now, in addition to memory, um, there has been also studies showing the impact of sleep on cardiometabolic functions. So this is actually, I wouldn't even venture to say that this is a little bit of a scary study in the sense that they looked at two days of four hour bedtimes. So people were sleeping for four hours, two consecutive days. And just with that reduction in sleep, they saw a decrease in leptin, which is a satiety hormone, which means that people felt hungrier because they didn't feel satisfied after they ate. It increased ghrelin, which is the hunger hormone. So in addition to not feeling satisfied, you also felt hungrier. So the subjects were in double problem. They weren't satisfied and they were also feeling hungrier. And they increased their self-reported hunger. So in other words, people tended to eat more and be hungrier if they only slept for four hours compared to sleeping for seven to eight hours. So the lack of sleep may lead to issues with diabetes and obesity because we will change hormone production that are associated with these metabolic disorders. Now, what about light and how does light affect sleep circadian rhythms and why is it that we're so interested in learning more and more about light? Well, the first thing, as I mentioned, light entrains or synchronizes the biological clock to the local time on earth. Now for that, we are more sensitive to blue light. Okay, we're almost like blue sky detectors. We're looking at blue light. Now, that doesn't mean that a warm incandescent or a yellow type color light doesn't affect the clock. You just need higher amounts of light to affect the clocks. Now, light also has an acute direct effect on people. Think of it as a cup of coffee. If you're tired in the afternoon, you get a one hour light exposure and you feel more alert. So it's, it's almost like directly you can feel that impact of light on, on humans. And then I, I do wanna talk, I will talk very briefly at the end of the talk, because this is a new area we're starting. Um, we just actually got a project we're gonna start collecting data on, which is looking at the impact of horizontal vertical lights on postural control and stability. And that is associated with falls risks. So what we have shown is that if you give people night lights that are around door frames, for example, people will get out of bed and they'll be able to um, orient themselves in the environment a lot better. And that reduces their risk for falls. So I'll cover a little bit about that um, in the next few slides. So, let me start with the impact of light on circadian entrainment or, or synchronization to the local time on Earth. This is a study that we did some time ago. It was in 2000, um, we published it in 2017. And we collected data, like we had a lighting device that gathers light information from the environment. And we collected data from office workers. So these are people were, were actually, um, federal office workers, and they were simply living their normal lives, but they were wearing those devices where we were measuring uh, their light exposure. And we also collected some uh, actigraphy data, which is looking at, uh, basically it's a Fitbit that measures your sleep. We were also looking at depression scores and subjective sleepiness scores. So these were questionnaires asking people about their um, sleep disturbances. Um, so those office workers that received the higher amount of morning light, they were more synchronized and therefore they fell asleep faster at night. 
They reported better sleep. So they reported having fewer sleep disturbances and they reported having fewer depression scores or lower depression scores. So in other words, light during the day helped them sleep better at night and reduced depression scores in just the general office workers population. We then collected some data during the COVID-19 pandemic. We were very interesting because suddenly with the shutdown of the pandemic, people were working from home. And a lot of times people were in their basements or in a closet or in a dark space because they weren't prepared to work from home. They suddenly had to work from home. So our hypothesis was that the more light they would get during the day, the better they would sleep and the better was their anxiety and mood. And we set out a survey to ask people two basic questions is, um, how bright is your environment indoors? And obviously it had to be subjectively because you know these, these were during the pandemic, so we couldn't collect data. And we also asked how many hours they were spending outdoors during the day. Because if you get out, you get a lot of light. Daylight is one of the best light sources for synchronizing the biological clock. So the more time you would spend outdoors, the hypothesis was that the people were gonna sleep better. So we got over 700 responses and we included in the analysis, which was over 550 responses, those that were employed but working from home or unemployed and staying at home. So this is the, the, the results that we found on the different scales that we looked at. So the first, uh, the graph here on the left um, is the at-home light exposure and it goes from very dim to very bright. And what we saw was, if you look at the graph here, a number 50 is sort of the norm, the middle of the scale. Anything above 50 is worse. Anything below 50 is better, except for the last graph, the graph in the bottom, which is positive affect, which is the opposite. A larger number is better and a, a, a smaller number is worse. So what you see here in this graph is as you increase the amount of at-home light exposure, you improve sleep disturbances, you improve sleep-related impairment, you reduce anxiety, and you reduce depression, and you increase positive affect. So everything goes beautifully to the right direction as we hypothesized it, it would go. More light during the day, better sleep at night. Then we asked about the time spent outdoors. And what we see is that between one and two hours is where things got much better. So if you were spending less than 10 minutes, people were having sleep disturbances, were having anxiety and depression. As you increase the number of hours outdoors, you decrease sleep disturbances, decrease anxiety, decrease depression, and improve positive affect. So again, it's very consistent with what we hypothesized that more light during the day would lead to better sleep and better mood. We also have been working, and this is actually a lot of the work that we've been doing currently, is looking at a tailored lighting intervention to improve sleep, mood, and behavior in Alzheimer's disease and related dementia patients. Now, the reason why I say a tailored lighting intervention, and I'll show you some examples of it, is because it's very hard for us sometimes to sit uh, 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 an Alzheimer's patient in front of a light box, for example. So we have to really deliver that light in a very passively way. And that's what we've been trying to do. And we've been actually very successful at doing it. So as I mentioned before, we know that Alzheimer's disease do have a lot of sleep-wake disturbances. Um, that might actually be one of the earliest symptoms in preclinical AD. So sometimes even prior to diagnosis, you start seeing these um, breakdown in the consolidation of sleep. So they sleep for an hour, they take a nap, then they wake up, they're not awake very much during the, the nighttime hours. So all of this uh, becomes sort of uh, broken down and, and not consolidated. And that sometimes happened even before 
the um, the 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 official or the 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 diagnosis of Alzheimer's. Um, there's evidence from animal and human studies that the opposite occurs too. The disease itself, once you have the AD pathology, that disrupts the sleep-wake cycle. So it becomes sort of a, 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 a catch-22, which one comes first, we don't know, but we do know that both of them can occur either prior to or after uh, the disease. And again, like I mentioned, is that there is this um, um, animal studies and human studies that suggest that um, prolonged wakefulness may increase the accumulation of A beta plaques in the brain. So um, this really study was published in, in the 90s. And I have to say, it was really a, um, to me, it was an inspiration. Um, I, I really got into this area because of, of the results of this study, which I thought were absolutely amazing. So um, Jus van Sommering, he's in the Netherlands, and he worked with Alzheimer's patients. And what he did is he got them in a very bright room. Um, so uh, this is, it's, it's 1100 lux, which to give you an idea is probably 10 times more more light than what people normally get in their homes in the evening, okay? So it was a lot of light and it was almost like, you know, sitting very close to a window, looking at a window or increasing the amount of light in the space by a lot. And what he showed here, which was very interesting. So these black bars that you see here are rest activity rhythms. The black bars is when people are active and the no bars is when they're inactive. So if you look at this Alzheimer's patient prior to the light exposure, there was almost no sleep. It was most of it awake. And in fact, what they, when they did the analysis, they showed that this participant was sleeping before between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m., not more than that. So then after four weeks of the light exposure, you can see this beautiful consolidated rhythm. So they were awake for, for 16 hours, asleep for eight hours, awake again for 16 hours. And you can see here on the right that they were sleeping from 10 p.m. to about 6 a.m. Then he removed the light and they became um, sort of messed up again and not sleeping and not consolidated again. So he, can, he clearly showed that that very bright light exposure during the day was very important for consolidated the rest activity rhythms. So after that, he did a um, study where he followed the patients for three and a half years. And what he showed was that the light exposure attenuated cognitive deterioration by 5%, ameliorated the depressive symptoms by 19%, and attenuated the increase in functional limitations by over half. So the results are very incredible. And if you think about it, he followed for three and a half years and he still saw a positive impact of light after those three and a half years. That's actually the same study and it was published on, on JAMA. So we then modeling after that, um, we changed a little bit from his study because what we did again is we were able to tailor the light so that it didn't have to be that bright because we used the spectrum that they were, the color of light that they were more sensitive to. Uh, so instead of using 1100 at, at the eye, we were using 400 lux at the eye, which is four times more than what you find at home instead of being 10 times more. And we also delivered in a way that everywhere they were looking, they were getting that light. So we did two studies. One was a short term, which was a randomized placebo control crossover design. So the one group started with an active light for four weeks. Then they had a four week washout period. Then they experienced a placebo light. And the other group started with a placebo light, had the four weeks washout, and then went to uh, the active light. Uh, this study was done in um, long-term care facilities, and we recruited 46 patients, and they received the light between the time they woke up, which was between 6 and 8 a.m., 
and then 6 p.m. in the evening when the lights were turned off and they were exposed to lower light levels. And the control light or the placebo light was all day in lower light levels, which is typically what you have in nursing homes and long-term care facilities. Then we did the long-term study where we followed the patients for six months. This was not a crossover, it was the same patient. We collected baseline, and then we collected data again at weeks 9, 17, 25, and then um, without lighting at week 37, even though I don't have the data for that here. So here are the results for the short-term study. So what we saw was, I'll start with the um, sleep disturbances. So if you look here, this is the Pittsburgh scale, uh, Pittsburgh Sleepiness Quality Index or PSQI. Anything above five means a person has sleep disturbances. So they started on baseline with sleep disturbances. After the active lighting intervention, they had a significant decrease in their sleep disturbances. With the control light or the placebo light, they started with sleep disturbances. They had a very slight de decline, but not statistically significant. So in other words, the difference between baseline and active light and baseline and control light was much greater in the active light, meaning that the active light was much more effective at reducing sleep disturbances. We saw the same thing with agitation. So there was a significant decrease in the agitation scores with the active lighting intervention. And there was a significant de decrease in the depression scores with the active lighting intervention and no change with the control lighting intervention. Now for the long-term study, I, I actually think this is very impressive um, because if you look at the sleep disturbances, the depression scores, and the agitation scores. What you see is they started on baseline with sleep disturbances. And over the course of six months, the sleep disturbances kept coming down to a point that after six months, it was below five. So they weren't diagnosed with sleep disturbances at the end of the intervention. And of course, six months in the life of an Alzheimer's patient make a big difference. And yet the lighting was able to help the patients reduce their sleep disturbances. Same thing with the depression scores and same thing with the agitation scores. It was a continuous decline in the symptoms, which suggests that it's a continuous effect. The longer you keep them on the light, the better it gets, or at least it's, it continues to have an effect. So just very sort of clearly and, and summarizing is, I always call it a sleep math, brighter days equal better nights. So if you are staying in dim light environments during the day, I urge you to get more lights in the room you stay in or to uh, go outdoors, go for a walk, especially in the morning, spend one to two hours outdoors because that will definitely help you with improving their sleep. Now, we're, I'm going to give you just a little bit of a new study that we are starting to collect data now. And that has to do with lighting, but it doesn't have to do necessarily with circadian rhythms. What that is, is a flickering light that promotes 40 hertz neural oscillation. So there has been some work with animals, and that was work out of MIT that showed that in Alzheimer's animal models, if they flickered a light that entrained the 40 hertz or the gamma waves in the brain, that that helped reduce A beta plaque and that the animals were actually um, doing better in some cognitive tasks, obviously for the animals, uh, but more importantly, they were reducing the plaque accumulation in the brain. And the hypothesis was that this gamma oscillation has in the past been associated with better performance and better memory. Um, and so the hypothesis too, it has to do with inflammation in the brain and this 40 Hertz flicker lights reduces the inflammation in the brain and that leads to uh, less accumulation of the plaques. So what we did, we expanded this work 
to um, healthy adults. We said, let's see if we can see the same increase in 40 hertz gamma when we give people a uh, flashing light. So this is how the intervention was. They were wearing this mask and this mask was flashing at 40 hertz. And we measured their brain activities. And what we saw was there was a significant increase in the 40 hertz power when the mask was energized compared to when the mask was not energized. So we were able to also see that gamma entrainment and that increase in the gamma power in the brain in healthy humans. So now what we're doing is we're actually doing a study where we are looking at expanding that work to mild cognitive impairment as well as healthy controls and trying to see if we can improve uh, cognition and performance in this population. And I think I have a slide, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now, I'm also go gonna very briefly talk about the impact of nightlight on, on postural control and stability. So this is the idea that you have these horizontal vertical lights around door frames um, in the bedrooms. So this is very dim light. It will not disrupt sleep. But when a person wakes up, the person has this visual uh, information that will help them get up and, and navigate in the space safely. Um, we performed not only lab studies, but we also performed field studies in uh, nursing homes and uh, assisted living facilities. And um, we had these lights on from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., so it was a night light. And we had, um, we recorded movements with infrared motion sensor cameras. So that was to look at falls or, or um, almost fall in residence. So we had a group of residents that received the light, then we have the same residents without the lights, so we collect the data with both. So what we found with the data, unfortunately we had to cut the data collection short because of COVID, but we had uh, a good number of subjects that we had collected, uh, 38 um, residences, and with complete data, we had 30 residents. And what we found was that the uh, false reduction was close to 35% reduction in falls in the group that received the nightlight. So clearly we were seeing the impact of this horizontal vertical light on the falls in the field, in the nursing homes. And we just got a new grant where we're gonna now expand that and install that in 200 um, rooms and follow them for at least six months to see if we see a positive result of that. We are also very happy that we are installing in four rooms here at Mount Sinai, and we're gonna be collecting some false data to see if we can also see the benefit of these uh, night lights in um, hospital rooms here in, 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 at Mount Sinai. So here's just uh, the, 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 the studies that we're gonna be doing for the rhythmic light. I'm sorry, this, this was out of order, we should have been a little bit earlier, but this is just what we are um, enrolling right now. So we're actually uh, recruiting for subjects that are age 55 and older. Uh, those that are diagnosed with uh, amnistic MCI or mild AD uh, with a MOCA of 17 to 25, and those that do, do not have um, sleep disturbances. For, for this particular study, we're actually looking at people without sleep disturbances. And then we're also collecting uh, healthy older adults, same age range, but that has a MOCA that it's about above um, 25. So in addition to this um, study with the flicker lights, we're also running a few studies um, with the tailored lighting intervention. Now I just chose two of them um, so that it doesn't get very confusing, but if anybody has any interest in learning more about some of the other studies we have. Again, we do have paid studies and we're very interested in the recruitment. Are you or someone you know over the age of 60 diagnosed with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease and type two diabetes, but are not insulin dependent? Do you have a history of sleep disturbance? If so, you or they may be eligible to participate in our study. We have 
The Light and Health Research Center at Mount Sinai are conducting a study looking at potential benefits of lights designed to improve sleep and metabolic health. The light treatment will be administered in your home or long-term care or assisted living environment for 26 weeks. If you or someone you know are interested in participating in our study, please contact us for more information and to determine your eligibility. Thank you. I'm a professor and director of the Light and Health Research Center at the Econ School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. In the past few years, we have been involved in a series of research projects looking at the impact of light on health and well-being. One of our current studies is looking at sleep in myocognitive impairment patients. Do you have trouble sleeping at night? Do you stay at home during the morning hours? Have you been diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment? You may be eligible to participate in one of our studies that it's looking at the optimum lighting conditions to help you sleep at night. We'd like to invite you or someone you know to participate in one of our studies. The total length of the study is nine months. And during six months, you'll be exposed to a special lighting that will be installed in your home. Prior to us installing the lights in your home, a nurse will come in the evening, will run some cognitive tests, will put a cap on you that it's measuring your sleep. You're gonna sleep with a cap on. The following day, she'll come back, she'll retrieve the cap, she'll run other cognitive tests on you. She'll also ask you to wear a couple of devices. One you're gonna wear on the wrist, and one you're gonna wear, wear as a pendant. And they're gonna be measuring your wrist activity as well as your light exposure. After one week, she'll come back and she'll install and turn on the lights in the room where you spend most of your day. The lights will be on for six months. We're coming back and repeating the assessments during those six months period. At the end of six months, we'll turn off the lights We'll wait another five to eight weeks and we'll come back and we'll do a final assessment. You will get paid to participate in that study, $50 every time we come back to do an assessment for a total of $250. We hope you're able to participate because we think that light can be a very powerful non-pharmacological intervention that can improve your sleep, health, and well-being. Thank you very much. All right, so here's just some of the examples of how we install the lights. I mean, it really depends on the participant. Um, one of the most successful applications we had was with a light table. Um, so in nursing homes, they tend to sit around tables and stay there all day, do activities, eat. So the light is actually illuminating. So when they look down, they're able to get the light that they, they need. Some people, they stay at home and they sit in the, the chair for most of the time. So we put the lights around the chair so that they can uh, get the lights. Other people, we do what we call light trays. So while they're having breakfast, they can have that light tray. So it really depends. That's why we tailor the light to make it easier for the participant to receive um, that light. Here are the types of questionnaires. I mean, those are not very time consuming questionnaires that we tend to ask either the participant or the caregiver to fill out the questionnaire depending on whether the participant can or cannot uh, fill out the question. And then we're improving a little bit. We're trying, this is the light, the new light meter that we're starting to work with to make it a little bit uh, prettier. This is the type of the wrist actigraphy, which is really like a watch or a Fitbit. So it just collects your, your rest activity patterns and we can then look at their sleep patterns after some time. So there's a lot of studies were part of it. Um, I do want to acknowledge uh, the folks at Mount Sinai ADRC. Thank you for having me as well as our project sponsors. And um, if you have any questions, um, we are, like I said, we're recruiting not for this one, but we're recruiting for many other um, studies. So you can co contact me or Barbara, and then there's a lot of new research coordinators. Once uh, you contact us, I will you know, send your contacts to all the research coordinators that 
um, uh, working with us on the recruitment. So with that, I, I do wanna thank you for your attention. And um, if you have any questions, um, Maria, back to you. Okay. So we are, I'm just gonna stop this, okay. Uh, we have just a quick poll before we move on to our Q&A section. So in just a second, I'm going to activate the poll. It'll bring it up on your screen. It'll be two multiple choice questions. You click your answers and hit submit, and then we'll move on to our Q&A portion. Now you may need to have to scroll down to see the second question, depending on how big your screen is. And Maria, they just click on it. Yep, they just click right the answer and then hit submit on the bottom. In the interim, if you finished your question and you are- yeah, you Actually, um, I've been getting um, a handful of questions um, that have come to me in the chat. So uh, Dr. Figueroa, let me just start with a couple of them. One question was, um, has, have you heard of this thing called happy light, <laughs> which is, a, I guess, some kind of cheap thing they sell at Target or whatever. And uh, what is that and does it have any relationship to the, the kinds of stuff we've been talking about today with you? Um, yes, I have heard about happy lights and there are many other happy lights around. Um, you know, and, and most of these light boxes are done for uh, seasonal affective disorder. And in general, um, you know, if you are actually looking at the box and getting the box, uh, the light at your eye, it should be effective. However, they tend to be uncomfortable because they tend to be too bright. And what happens is sometimes you, you turn the box a little bit and by turning it a little bit, you miss all the light that you can get at the eye. So if you are careful at using that, it can be effective. Personally, I think you should be looking out a window, sitting out on a porch or something uh, that you can get the light much more comfortable. Okay, okay, interesting. Um, an another person was asking, first of all, someone was saying, where can we buy the light fixtures used? But so we're talking about two different things here. There are these products for consumers, things like happy lights. The, the lights um, that Dr. Figueroa is talking about are for research uh, purposes and are not something that you can you can go out and buy. However, what she's saying is that the light that we get from outside is uh, the best and um, cheapest, <laughs> probably um, alternative. I know one person asked, um, do you measure, you know, we, we hear you should sleep in a cool room, not too hot a room. When you're doing your research, do you, is the temperature of, of the room the person is in factoring in in any way? Well, um, not physiologically, no. Psychologically, maybe. I mean, there has been some work being done looking at more of the, whether the, the light looked warm or looked cool, so more blue or more yellow and how people had the feeling of, of uh, thermal feeling in the space. But in general, no, the, 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 the temperature in the room should not affect how the light will impact you. So for example, if you go outdoors in the winter or you go outdoors in the summer, you are getting, obviously you're getting a little bit less light in the winter, but you're still getting a lot of light outdoors. So it should have the same effect on, on the circadian system. And how many luxes, is that how you say it, yeah. um, are, in, are in the lights that you use? Well, um, so, Lux, it, it's a little bit complicated. So lux is, it's how much light is falling on a meter, for example, okay? And we actually are now doing a study with one of our undergraduate students. Uh, he's a Sherman scholar who's doing study to try to see if there's an app on the phone that you can actually measure that lux. Now, if you're gonna go out and buy the box of the bulb will not give you the lux value because depending on how distant that um, fixture is from the eye, it's gonna change the lux level. So what you're looking at in a bulb is the lumen in the bulb. 
And for the lumen, you're looking at at least a 3000 lumen on the bulb. So this is a, this is a bright bulb. It's not something dim because what you want is to increase the amount of light. So the way we recommend, and we do have a website where we actually show people how to build some of these fixtures with like paper and so on. So I, I'm happy to share that with you guys and, um, you know, people can go on the website and look. But what you want to do is maybe put one on each side because this way it doesn't have to be too bright. So it goes one on each side, it becomes much more comfortable. And try to hide the direct view of the bulb. Always use a shade that it's translucent, but it's a shade so that you don't see the bulb directly because that can be very uncomfortable. Right. So uh, I see here, a, a couple of people have a similar question that when, when we're talking about um, the light, uh, is this light you know, that's coming directly into your eyes? Does it matter, is it the environment that your body is in? Does it matter if the light is hitting your legs, your neck, your eyes? No, light at the eye. It has to be light at the back of the eye. And ideally it's light coming directly into your eye. That's the best one. Now there has been studies in the past showing that the light in the back of the knee would affect the circadian system. Those were never replicated. So okay. I do not recommend that. Now UV, radiation for vitamin D, that's sunlight on the skin. It's not even light bulb. It has to be sunlight on the skin because that's UVB, which does not, it's not typically emitted by a light bulb. Okay. So you want a light that it's in your field of view. That's why you don't want everything coming out of a light box, for example, because it can be very uncomfortable and you can have negative side effects of that. Some people can get jittery and so on. So try to just increase the overall ambient light, open up your windows, sit by a window. That's that's where you get this general light into the space. Right, so that that's similar to a question somebody else had. So when, you, when you're talking about at home light exposure, you mean coming through the windows. You don't mean how many lights are on in your house. Is that well, right? You can add, like we're doing in the studies, we're adding the lights in the home. If you have a window and if you can sit by a window, that's very good. But you have to be facing the window. If you sit with your head against the window, you're not getting that light at the eye. Okay, so sit facing a window. If you have a deck, sit, sit outside on your deck. Um, go for a walk, uh, even go for a car ride or... Uh, those are ways that you're getting that light in the morning. If you're, you can't, you're homebound, you can't get out, your apartment is dark or your home is dark, that's when you start adding these additional table lamps or floor lamps that will increase the amount of light bouncing off of surfaces in the space. Okay, terrific. Um, so uh, this, uh, one or two people were asking about um, how would they know if they would be appropriate for the for the studies or not? And I was uh, mentioning that there's a screening process yeah. um, where we would ask uh, you a lot of questions. Um, our team here at the ADRC collaborates with Dr. Figueroa's team. Um, so, you know, if you have any questions, you can certainly start by calling anyone here in the ADRC and we can get you pointed in, in the right direction. Um, part of this um, criteria has to do with whether or not you might be having trouble with sleep. And um, part of the criteria may have to do with your uh, cognition, whether you have a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment or mild dementia. And some of uh, people on this talk would already know that because they're part of the ADRC, but some people may not. So um, you can always reach out to any of us to ask um, you know, how to get you in the, in, the, in the right direction to find out more information about um, being considered for one of one of her studies um, for for you or a loved one. Um, that's all the questions uh, I see in the chat. Yeah. Am I missing anything? I, I saw one, and I, I I am very compelled to answer to that one about uh, looking directly at the sun. Ah, do not I just, look. Do not stare at the sun, please. You don't need. You can sit on the shade. You don't have to look at the sun. Um, and there's a question about sunglasses. Yes, you can still wear sunglasses outside because there's so much light outside 
that even if you have sunglasses, I don't recommend early in the morning and you probably don't need early in the morning because it's not as bright, but if, if it's high noon um, and there's a lot of sun, you're sitting on the shade, by all means, wear your sunglasses. You have to protect your eyes against that. Um, there's a lot of a lot of light out, even with the sunglasses, you should be okay. But please right. don't look directly at the sun. Right. So coming directly into your eyes just means being outside. Yes. Uh, when you're outside, it's just, yeah. right. if you're putting a, a fixture, that's where you, you don't want a fixture behind you or you don't want the window behind you. You want in front of you. But that's not to say you have to look directly at a light bulb or at the sun. And someone tagged on here, does it matter if it's cloudy or not? A cloudy day is still a lot of light, I'm assuming. It's still a lot of light. Let me give you an idea of numbers. So if you're on a bright, sunny day like this weekend, which was gorgeous, right? It's about 100,000 lux at the middle of the day. On a cloudy day, 10,000 lux, 8,000 lux. So you still have a lot of light. What you get at home, 100 lux or less. So what you need, at least 500 lux, okay? So you still have a lot of light outdoors. Be in the shade is perfectly fine. You still get enough. Terrific, okay. All right, I, I think we got through everything. Um, this was just a fascinating talk. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Um, it's so interesting to hear the whole, the whole picture. Um, so thank you so much. And um, again, feel free, anybody here to reach out with any more questions for us. Um, her talk, will, uh, which we just recorded, uh, will be on the ADRC website within a couple of weeks um, if you want to watch it again or if you had to come in a couple of minutes late. And um, I want to thank some, you know, everyone for joining us today. And we um, look forward to seeing you at the next talk.